Hello, I'm Malcolm West and this is Project Management Basics, everything you need to make your project a success. Uh, and this is episode 5, we're going to be looking at communicating. So, um, the first four sessions were about getting your project started. Uh, the started at the start, uh, rolling around between planning and risk management, etc. And the first part of communication is also going to be linked to starting as well. If we can get the communication structure set up right as part of the definition and planning of the project, then it's going to make life much easier as we go on forward. So we're going to look at a bit of all of that rolled together. So, uh, why communicate? There are lots of reasons why it's really important to communicate as part of your project. You know, project management, that's what we're talking about here. Management is about managing other people, it's about delegation. On s very small projects, you might actively be involved in delivering part of the technical aspects of a project as well. It's quite common for your first project to be a technical area you're involved in, so you might be part of the delivery team as well. But we're talking here about your role as a manager. And so, you're not doing all this work yourself, you're delegating it to other people. Um, an important part of delegation is explaining to people what they're supposed to be doing and monitoring to make sure they're doing it and discussing aspects of that work that they need to talk about with you. So that's delegation, coordination, uh, monitoring of that. Um, there'll be resolution of some issues that come up um, and then there's reporting as well, so explaining uh, upwards above you about what's going on and of course that's also about coordination as well requirements perhaps changing from the organization um, or interactions with people with whom you can't influence um, and then we've got reassuring in relationships so um, we're reassuring those stakeholders above us in the project um, and also uh, there's the relationship management if you can establish a good relationship with the people you're reporting to and the people you're working for um, and the people who are working for you as well, then you'll find it much easier to get them to do what you want them to do uh, in terms of managing the project. So lots of good reasons why communications are important um, and you know, the softer skills that you have as a project manager um, are going to stand you in good stead if you want to be successful. So we're going to talk a bit more about the, the sort of mechanics of communications here, but actually those soft influencing skills, if you can acquire those, if you have those, that's very helpful. So let's just explore that a little bit further. Project manager um, sits at the center of the communications within the project environment, communicating up to stakeholders. So these are, the, this is the generic term, if you like, for the people who have an interest in the success, perhaps also of the failure, but the success of the project. And the project manager will be responsible for communicating the work of the project team, the contributors, the people delivering the project, through to the stakeholders. So all communications here should go through the project manager or the project manager should be aware of those communication channels and what's being discussed within them. Um, you can't manage it if you, people are making other decisions and agreements without your involvement. So by stakeholders we might mean a whole load of different people. There will be the sponsor or customer of the project, the person for whom you are delivering the project directly, but there will be also other interested parties like regulators perhaps. Um, and affected community members. Projects might um, affect uh, the local public. Um, they might affect other people within your business area. So they will have some say, you know, or some interest in the project. Um, they may not have, as you think, any direct influence or control, but if you can satisfy their interests and their wants, then you can be much more successful in removing somebody that's going to be objectionable about what you're doing. That's a bit of a cynical way of looking at it, but it's a very good way of doing it. And if you refuse to communicate with these people and don't talk to them and don't explain what's going on, then you put people's backs up. It's a classic case um, time and time again. So thinking about the broader set of people um, who might be affected by what the project is doing and thinking about how you might communicate. Um, communication can help head off problems before they occur. So it's really important to sit down and think about this, try and map out who the stakeholders are, and in many bigger projects people will do that. They'll create a, a document which are a list of the stakeholders, um, what you think each stakeholder group's uh, interest is, and how they can be influenced, and what you might need to get from them, what you might need to give them, how frequently you're going to communicate with them. So the sponsor and customer, or customer, you know, that's there's going to be a much closer relationship there. But that wider group of people um, you also need to think about as well. You don't necessarily need to write it all down and document it very heavily, but it's worth thinking about. And communications can just be phoning them up, dropping by their office to tell them how things are going, you know, etc. But it's important to do those things. 
when we think about managing down as the project manager perhaps more what you think I was going to talk about when I talked about uh, communications we're dealing with the people who are contributing to the success of the project team members suppliers the people that are doing the work which is going to deliver whatever the project is supposed to be producing um, your relationship with them um, has to be uh, quite clearly mapped out uh, and they have to understand what you're expecting them to do um, and how frequently they're supposed to be telling you how they are getting on so we have some tools for dealing with this sort of idea about controlling communication and these work both up and down up to stakeholders down to contributors it's about specification first and foremost so we will be producing specifications for the the deliverables for the project they might be product descriptions work packages um, technical delivery documents etc within those you should have a section about communication explaining how frequent communication should be what format it should take what the communications channels are and what the communications channels should not be you don't want people you don't want technical people talking straight to the regulator um, without agreeing with them what the objectives are going to be and what the bounds are going to be for those sort of communications etc so you know identifying those things up front tolerance is a really um, important idea here so you know I'm sure we've all been in situations where micromanagement is a problem you might have been micromanaged from above and realized just how frustrating it is and how much of a soaking of time and effort it can be um, and also you may have on occasions micromanaged people down yourself and you might imagine how they feel about that a really good way of dealing with that because you know there's lots going on in a project you can't be doing everything yourself it's about delegation is about as part of that specification setting up tolerances so um, you might discuss with your customer or sponsor a tolerance for the project that might be a certain amount of days they might be prepared for it to be late or quality requirements they may be prepared to allow it to slip or cost overruns they might be prepared to accept those are delicate things to have to discuss but you know it's a project things change unfortunately these things can happen um, and agreeing tolerances like that with people um, enables you to say well I'm going to management by manage by exception unless it looks like it's going outside of those bounds I'm not going to pester you with every little thing if there's little changes going on and they fall within the total of those changes fall within those tolerances I'm not going to tell you about it um, I might mention it or cover it in my regular reporting whatever that's been agreed but I'm not going to phone you up every time to tell you about every little thing that's changing because we've agreed some tolerances that we're prepared to work within and you can do the same going down to your work packages below obviously if you've got a tolerance of five thousand pounds you can't give ten work packages below you a tolerance of a thousand pounds each because you're going to breach that but you can divide that up in a way that you as project manager thinks addresses the complexity and risk and planning of the project so those are the tools that you have and so getting some of that stuff in place um, at the beginning of the project when you're planning and breaking down the project into the deliverable areas and documenting those is important of course then there's an ongoing communication strand um, you're hopefully the gateway between communications from the stakeholders or questions from contributors through to the stakeholders should probably be coming through you you should be documenting those documenting the answers distributing them back out then you're aware of what's going on within the project if other people are doing those they should be copying you in on that so you're aware of that and that should obviously all be documented as part of the project information so let's go and have a look at doing some of that sort of thing in practice um, so I've got my Outlook here and I've got an email, somebody sent me feedback on a work package. I want to store that as a piece of information in the project. Um, what I'm going to do is drag that file out of Outlook onto my desktop, in fact we'll put it over here, like that. And then I'm going to go off and open my Community Edition tool. So we're using Community Edition as we did earlier in some of the earlier sessions for documenting what's happening on the project. So uh, here we are and I'm going to open my project as we said we might have a number of different projects in here there's the office move project um, I'm going to come down to the section that's relevant which is my PM and board communications and so um, I want to add this file to here um, in community edition we do this by the add process here in other products we can do it by drag and drop um, and so I'm going to browse off and find that file which will be on my desktop and it's going to be here this one 
Um, and if I want to, I can say who it was from, like that. Just useful to help document that audit trail. And that's now stored. It's taken a copy of that and included it here within the project documentation. Um, these sort of pieces of evidence that you store, generally they don't get versioned. They're just here to record something that happened. Um, you could version them but in practice it's rare to do that. Um, but if we want to then come back and see this piece in the future we click and open it, it will open as uh, an Outlook message and we can see the message that was there, who sent it, when they sent it etc. We can see the any files and documents that were attached to that, any chain of communication that was in there as well. So storing emails in here is a really really good way of documenting things rather than you've had a discussion then you make you know transferring it on some formal document and getting it signed off just put the email in. That works perfectly well. Um, in fact, in many ways better. So, um, storing emails and any other documentation that comes up into these placeholders is a really important part of communication. Just get into the habit of doing it, storing the emails. Um, you could, if you want to, drop them all into a folder and link the folder to here, but it's probably best to put them in directly if you can. When we talked about setting up specifications and tolerances and things like that, we can do that of course within the documents that are here, within the templates probably. So if I come to the deliver process within um, this three-step approach, um, and I can see my definitions for the product descriptions, so the things we're trying to produce, and the work packages, how we're going to ask people to deliver those for us. Um, now there's one template provided here, but in practice I'm going to have many work packages within my project. So I'm going to just come and add another one. I use the add file again, but I'm going to go to the template library and pick up work package, um, and I'm going to call it work package 2 like that and that'll be exactly the same template as the first one but I can add as many of these as I want to of course in practice you might rename them to be the actual thing they are um, often they're numbered just for reference it's easier to reference WP1 WP2 and then it's perhaps its, its actual name afterwards and then we're going to do some um, we're going to have a look at the sort of things we might document within a work package and this is of course again a standard template it's one of the standard Prince 2 templates that we provide um, you don't necessarily have to fill all of this in but again it's a really useful guide as to what the sort of things that you might be expected to do if you're carefully documenting your project so here's my uh, template um, and we've got a description of what the work is going to be you know the technical information about how we're going to actually do it, how we want it done, um, interfaces etc, change control requirements, um, coming down here tolerances so and reporting arrangements. You're giving somebody some piece of work you want them to do, you're explaining how you want them to do it, how you want them to measure and demonstrate that it's been done properly, what tolerances they have around that, what reporting arrangements there's going to be. Change control is obviously about as we're saying changes happen, at what level do they need to tell you and at what level um, do you need to sign off things etc so a whole load of things here about planning that out and that will have come from your planning that you did earlier um, laying out those tasks and breaking down those deliverables packaging them up for people and it's about putting all this right sort of information in here um, and then you know there's no excuse for people not to do it is the people don't always do what you ask them to do on projects um, but by monitoring and we'll come back and talk about that some more in the next sessions um, you'll be able to see whether people are doing what you expect and obviously if they're not you'll be able to monitor them a bit more closely perhaps get into some micromanagement and get them back on track um, but this is about setting people out in the right framework um, you can't legislate for everything but if you put the right sort of structure in place to start off with it becomes much more likely that you're going to get the outcomes that you want later on so documenting what you expect people to do um, and then recording what happens about that afterwards recording the communications between stakeholders and contributors etc okay so let's just jump back and finish that off so that was talking about communicating we're going to be going on into the nitty-gritty of delivery next um, and we really are then out of the sort of starting aspect and into how we're delivering what we're supposed to do on the project that's what we want to do the project's not about endless planning and setting things up it's about getting stuff done that is what a project is here for and that's what we're going to focus on that bit more in the next session thank you